We're threatened by something called electronic voting machines. What we have concerned about is the way in which they can be compromised, they can be hacked into, they can be used for fraud. This is all something we cannot tolerate. So I want you to get the true story on this and come back to me, go over it with me, and we will see what we have to do to help preserve democracy for the future. That's all I have to say today. Democracy in America is in a state of uncertainty because of electronic voting. A number of election officials have told me they've been using these electronic voting machines for several years. And we've never had a problem, they say. To which I say, how do you know? And you push it in until it locks. What does the red X indicate? It's indicating that you uh, voted for that, the, for that candidate. But where does it indicate that the vote has been counted? How do I know that my vote's been counted? The memory should have taken it. But how do I know that it has? How do I know the system didn't crap out? Nobody knows. A third of Americans will be using new electronic voting machines, which are simple, clear, easy to use, and totally unverifiable. A recount is meaningless. When you go in there and you, you're going to place a vote, it's, it's a pretty important decision that you're making. The fact that it can possibly be manipulated, it does concern me, but um, I, think, I think that they know about this, and I think that uh, whoever is in charge of getting this in order would eventually take care of it. Computer security people are sometimes called paranoid. That's by people who don't know computer security. The apparent paranoia of computer security people is simple prudence that comes from not having been prudent enough in the past and having gotten burned. Before there's manipulation, there are glitches that take place with the newness of any computer software anyway. Why would you want to chance those kinds of glitches on something so important as the, as the vote? Yeah, hacking in would be, would be fairly straightforward. You could break it at the server, you could break in the machines, you could break the cards the machine use. You've got a whole lot of options. Each terminal, before it is ever deployed for an election, goes through what's called logic and accuracy testing. This is a very, very stringent test of each one of the voting stations to ensure that someone from the jurisdictions tests each component, make sure everything operates and records votes correctly, to make sure that they functions correctly when it's deployed for the election. With what was leaked over the internet and this stuff that was purchasable over eBay, you could set up in your home a, a voter station if you had a, uh, a Windows XP computer. There is no doubt in my mind that I can break any of these electronic voting machines. I could change the course of the elections by shifting votes around from one candidate to another, from one bond issue to another. Uh, we've had their representative before the Solano County Board of Supervisors that did not answer questions to, to my satisfaction, did not give me a real comfortable feeling that just that we're going to be here, we're going to run your election, it's going to be great. I would go in and vote on a paper ballot because I just feel that uncomfortable about it. I read the goal, do it on a piece of paper, it's the same thing. You know, it doesn't have to be an electronic device and the paper is more secure, you know, that my vote is going to count. And that's the whole point of me voting. I want my vote to count. Which way is Harvard Square? That way. I myself would, would find it perfectly reasonable to use paper ballots. Uh, we know that they're just as accurate as, as anything else, probably, probably more accurate. Uh, the defects of paper ballots seem to be two. One is that it would be more expensive to have them counted and for the electoral machinery to take place. And the second is that it's slow, which means that CNN wouldn't get its results as fast, but that frankly doesn't bother me. Electronic systems tend to have glitches. They can be programmed to cheat. And 
Uh, very often there's a cloud of controversy around a result that doesn't make sense to people and you want to have a recount. So for all these reasons, uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me to have an election where you don't have a paper copy of every vote that was cast. I'm not against electronic voting. I think it's going to make voting accessible to people who might other, not otherwise be able or want to go to a poll. Until they've got it worked out to the point where it's flawless and can't be compromised in any way, I think I, I'm for taking a piece of paper and stuffing it in a box, you know. It's just there's no way of knowing whether if you press the button on the screen, whether that vote has ever gone cast. If the voting software were hacked in November, no one would ever know. At the time of the most important election in our country's history, we have the greatest doubts about our right to vote. And we have the greatest fear as to whether thousands of voters are going to once again be disenfranchised. Only this time, there will be no evidence. Mic check, one, two, one, two, mic check, one, two. I've heard that they're more efficient. Uh, I heard that the electronic voting machines are um, a lot easier in terms of being able to count the votes. We're not opposed to technology per se. Um, but we think we have to be smart about it, and we have to be careful about it, and we have to recognize that electronic voting machines aren't magic. I think electronic voting machines are good. I think it's a technology that's on its way, but I think in the end it, they'll work out the problems with it and, and work out a way for people to verify who they voted for, and it'll be a good thing. I think our voting system in, in 2004 is uh, extremely rickety and, and uneven. It's uh, it has, it has grown up piecemeal over a couple hundred years in an extremely decentralized uh, way. And it is not a very coherent system. I mean, our technology is very uneven and very flawed. Um, and our system of election administration is not really worthy of a country that claims to be a, gr a great democracy. You know, the stories about uh, election manipulation, are, you know, start with the starting of this, or, of this country and continue to current day. But I think the community of people who are cognizant of that was pretty small up until the 2000 election. I think what happened in the 2000 election is that suddenly everybody realized that our election systems were not as robust as we'd like them to be. An increasing number of problems has been reported by computer security analysts and voters alike. September 2002, Miami-Dade County, as well as the rest of the state of Florida, experienced absolute and complete chaos with respect to the use of electronic voting machines. We've run over 300 elections on it, and we've not had a hiccup. The biggest problem that arose in September 2002 was the fact that machines could not be turned on, and so precincts did not open on time long, long lines, voters turned away from the polls, voters standing in the hot sun for hours on end, unable to vote, and many people were disenfranchised. Mistakes were made in the last election. I lived in Florida and I lived in Broward County. Thank God I didn't live in Palm Beach County. In fact, our systems have been, I think, very performed very well in past elections as well. There's been no question about that, quite honestly. Okay, this is my uh, substitute ballot. Box here. When the machines is not working, we use these. If it freezes up, do the votes get lost that were already voted on in there? No, or? no. It just affects that one machine. But it don't affect the whole whole. It don't affect the whole. Uh, it don't right. affect all the machines. Just one machine. But let's say let's say I voted at 10 a.m. and at 3 p.m. one of the machines had a problem. Would those votes still be counted in that machine, or would they be? I really couldn't tell you that much. The best story I know is what happened recently in Palm Beach County. Teresa Lepore managed to mess up the election in 2000 with her butterfly ballot. To solve that problem, she bought electronic voting machines in 2002. Machines that have had a series of failures. She's jeered at all our concerns. And in the last election in August, she was voted out of office. And then she had the audacity to call for a recount. So she was voted out of office on the same electronic machines that she bought and asked for a recount, which basically you can't do on the equipment. They had a bunch of problems where they had to extend the polls. A lot of polls didn't open and things, so we had to stay open to 9 o'clock. Machines didn't turn on? Or uh, they had a problem getting them programmed or whatever. 
flaws have been detected in all the voting machines made by the three major manufacturers. Google, Equoria, and DFNS. On topic number one, D-Bold, we have a company that lies. Yes, I'll say it, lies. I obtained a release notes for GEMS, which miscounted nearly 3,000 votes on March 2nd in San Diego County. They did not fix any of the problems. I have those now on the internet because I don't believe just me, go look. This stuff was never corrected. Computer security analysts attribute voting machine problems to questionable software design and poor judgment by machine developers and contractors. If we were handling gambling equipment or financial institutions, we put a lot more protections in place than exist with our voting system. And those protections would be designed into the equipment and they'd be designed into the procedures we're using. So banks will have multiple paper backups, they'll have difficult to forge electronic audit trails, they reconcile all this information on a nightly basis, not infrequently, they discover errors someplace, they can roll back and correct them. They have audits, sometimes surprise audits, and very little of those principles are applied to the voting system. They obviously need to be. We are confident that our system is safe, it is secure, it is accurate. I'm not concerned with what Debole employees say, I'm not concerned with what academicians from California say. I'm, I'm not concerned with what people who are not outside this system, who don't, do not know what we're doing say, except to the extent that we review those things for things that might, we need to be concerned about, and then we go and check on those. But, but we're not paranoid here. We're, we, we're very confident of what we're doing. If the batteries are low on the machines, the serial numbers can come out scrambled. Yeah. Wow. So they had all these votes coming in to Nobody machines knows. allegedly that didn't I'm exist or that the I'm numbers were coordinated to other machines. Check. Because it's electronic, there's no way for us really to know what's going on. The code was very shoddy. It wasn't the kind of code that a good programmer would have written. Um, there were a lot of places where there's something called cryptography, which is used to encrypt or protect information in the system, that it was done with many errors. They were, they were using the wrong functions. They used functions that were known to be insecure. There's no accounting. There's no way to check if the votes have ever been counted. They're just a scam, mm -hmm. a total scam. What makes you think that? A lot of the reports I've read, the reports Avi Rubin has come out with, um, there, and also my background in computer science. Brought you guys here today as computer experts. Give us your two cents, what your take of the system is. This thing looks like a bunch of junior programmers wrote it. I mean, there's are problems we solved 20 years ago. We know how to do this correctly, and it doesn't even come close. To build something like a voting system on top of Windows is just unconscionable. Uh, particularly an old version of Windows, known for being buggy, even among the Windows thing. That's like being, that's like being <laughs> the drunk in the family of town drunks, where all the <laughs> other town drunks are like, whoa, he's got problems. <laughs> you, don't really, you really don't know what's happening. It's a black box. Something comes in, something comes out. You're not really sure what happens in the middle. I am decertifying all touchscreen systems in California until specific security measures are in place to safeguard the November vote. Hackers are sophisticated computer technologists who can break into voting computer systems without being detected. For me to believe that hackers can break into the electronic voting machines, I probably have to see some proof. I was featured by 2020. Uh, breaking into one of the lo world's largest financial institutions. We were able to break in in two weeks, and within two weeks we had full command and control uh, of the entire financial institution, including the capability to transfer funds, look at people's accounts, etc., etc. I began looking at electronic voting systems roughly three weeks ago, and uh, the interesting finding in three weeks is that first and foremost, the attack surface is very broad, very wide, and very deep. This is a, you know, a very quick overview of what 
the attack surface would be. The attack surface is from the time you create the ballot, the time you load the ballots into the DRE, to the time you distribute the DREs to the different polling places. Machines have to be transported to the voting stations two to five days prior to the elections, where understandably, you can't put armed guards around them, so their security is compromised. The combat team. These terminals are stored in an empty gym overnight without any guards or any protection. You know, getting able to getting close enough to touch that machine and make some changes to it, you know, could potentially be a pretty easy thing to do. Most places I've heard of, when they have electronic voting machines, they're either delivered to the polling place one or two days in advance. Or apparently in San Diego County, I am told, uh, the voting machines were delivered to the homes of election workers uh, several weeks in advance. Uh, most of them they put in the back seat. Were you surprised when your daughter came home with voting machines? No, we, we knew this was going to happen. They heard about it before. We were hoping it wouldn't happen, but you know. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so you brought all these machines in, yeah. you, your parents? In and through here. They were all the machines were, Yeah, the machines were lined up against the wall here. At no point did they ever ask for, uh, for any form of identification at all. No proof of uh, registration to vote, no proof of anything. When the units go through their logic and accuracy testing before they're deployed for an election, and the, the test goes fine and they're ready to go, they're closed and there's a, a protective tamper seal that's placed on every one of the units and it also has a serial number on it. If those ship to the location and that seal is broken or that number does not match, that unit is not used in that election. This is the seal. But you could run one of these on a Xerox machine. Yes, you could. And then this particular seal is on regular paper with some sort of adhesive on the back. Stick them paper. Oh, wait, you know what? You can actually re readhere it, can't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They they put they put pretty little stickers on that mean absolutely nothing. Dr. William Arbell was on a team at Rabbit Technologies hired by Beeble to attempt to hack into their electronic voting machines. This is known as a red team exercise. With respect to the locks was that they were easily picked, uh, you know, within 15 seconds uh, manually, uh, a little bit more time with a gun, uh, a pick gun, uh, and, and worse, the, all of the machines actually share the same common key. So a poll worker from one precinct could open the machines at another precinct. Um, and worse, we were able to take the key to a, a locksmith and actually ask them to duplicate it for us, and they gladly did. Um, so. There was no markings on the key indicating, you know, do not duplicate or any kind of additional measures like that. So in the electoral process, there are thousands of voting machines, thousands of card readers, thousands of voter smart cards. There are thousands of poll workers, probably hundreds of election judges, hundreds of other personnel, all of which presents a piece of the attack surface unto themselves. It's like Swiss cheese. The, the, there are a million ways in and a million ways out, and it just depends on, on your physical circumstances as far as how much you can screw things up. Smart card hacking. We're waiting for a helicopter to come pick us up to go visit a computer hacker who's found some big flaws. We have computerized voting software, and he's got to show it to us. The work I do right now is uh, computer uh, research for security, basically calculating the amount of time that it takes to break into uh, a company based on the software that they're running. Prior to that, I was uh, consulting, uh, doing penetration testing and forensics on uh, power companies and financial institutions. Right. These are the cards that you'd basically be given when you went, walked in to vote and uh, put them in the voter machine. The machine has a smart card or a voter access card, which is 
uh, placed in the machine, which contains a ballot on it to allow someone to vote only once. Uh, but when we looked closely at that, we found that they hadn't implemented that correctly and they hadn't taken advantage of the security features of the smart card. So we showed how you could uh, manufacture these smart cards in bulk and use them to vote multiple times. Smart cards, basically, they interact with another device that I was able to find on eBay. With what was leaked over the internet and this stuff that was purchasable over eBay, you could set up in your home a, a voter station if you had a, uh, a Windows XP computer. By getting the source code that was released, we discovered where in the code the, the buffer overflow is, and it's, and it's at a point where the card is being examined. Buffer overflow attack is a very devastating attack from a computer science point of view. Basically what we're talking about is writing more data than they expect and then having our little machine code program execute at the end of it. Instead of using the card that we were issued, we just throw that away or save it for a souvenir and pull out the one that we fashioned at home, right? And we put that one into the machine. The, the machine goes to read what's on this card and then it, it reads an amount that it's so much more than is what expected. Um, you know, it's expecting this much and it's getting this much. So now you're starting to write over memory. And as soon as you figure out which, what the magic number is, how far over that memory you have to write to get to the next instruction pointer, now I put my program at the end of that and boom, we get it to do whatever we want it to do. Again, change the rules, every third vote counts, no vote counts, they're all gone one way, they're all gone another way. A whole precinct can go, and once you've got the precinct, or maybe a key precinct, then you've got the county. And again, it's, it just goes up from there. A majority of counties are a key county, and you've got the whole state. And from there, it's a majority of states are a key state, and you've got the whole country. Central server hacking. If you think about, like, 12 years ago, and I wanted to manipulate the results of an election, it'd be pretty hard, right? Because I'd have to find those two guys who are holding the box that people come in and drop things into, right? And I have to convince those guys to go along with my plan. Nowadays, with, this, uh, with how this particular tabulation software is set up, all I need to do is convince one of maybe a hundred people or be one of those hundred people to do it. The most vulnerable system is not a voting machine. It's a PC. It's the mothership. It's the last stop where all the votes come in. Absentee votes, paper ballots, and touchscreen votes all come to rest here before they become the official election results. And of course, if you were going to tamper with an election, would you rather run around to a thousand polling places tampering with 4,500 different machines or would you rather go to the mothership where you just have to tamper with one thing and you can get them all? All of that data is stored in a Microsoft Access database which requires no password. Access is a toy product that is very convenient but not secure and not scalable. It doesn't have any sort of it doesn't have any sort of verification or logging mechanism, so if you do something in it, you don't know. There'll be no tracks. So imagine, you know, you got this guard at the front door, but the back door's wide open. And when you come in from the back door, nobody records what you're doing. Without entering any password, with no security whatsoever, I'm in. I can do anything I want. There's two sets of records in the voting system itself, in the tabulation server one set that comes up when you do a spot check on a district by district basis or a poll by poll basis, right? So that comes up and that exactly matches the data that it was sent. But then there's another set of records that contains the totals. That can be tampered with and the two aren't connected to each other. I can write a very simple script Here's six pretty simple lines. It does something. Notice there's nothing visible happened. Now look at the total for Canada Day. 10,000 votes. Once you have access to the machine itself, it's amazingly simple, concerningly simple. Well, someone had to create it, so obviously there's got to be some way for someone else to come in and back engineer it to try and get it there and manipulate the, the results of, of that system.
Americans have the right to monitor the counting or tabulation of their votes at their polling places. Monitoring tabulation is really basically right now with electronic voting machines the only way of knowing whether or not votes were actually um, counted accurately. Hi, you're closing? We we wanna we wanna watch the closing procedures which are public. Like lot, but don't. Okay, no cameras in the polling place. What am I supposed to do? Call the police or actually stand outside? Seth Lita. Can you do me a huge favor? Call me back because um, they're about to call the cops on us. Um, so please call me back immediately. Thanks. So this is the way that they take the PEB that they use to collect the information from all the machines and they put it in one computer and then um, ask the machine to just tally up the totals. So we're going first to the collection area and then to the headquarters? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We are at the, um, one of the many collection center in, centers in the county. This county has over 700 polling places. After the polling place is closed and the equipment is collected, it goes to a series of approximately 20 or so uh, collection centers. And then there it is inventoried and taken to the uh, central tabulation room. So when people bring us the results, we go in, basically insert it, upload it, okay, and move on to the next one. Where does it go? Uh, elections department. I guess they have a computer network. Transmit just over the internet? Yeah, we have a phone line connection. It dials out to the uh, election center. Could be a problem there? No, I, this is basically, I think it's a closed system. It's just we're just collecting directly to the to the election center. So I don't think there's much concern about that. We went to the collection center. Now we're headed to county headquarters. What happened to county headquarters? County headquarters is where all the votes are counted. Various forces. It's always our decision. The key areas of the room where the, the brain trust is, is that corner over there. If you see all the wires coming out, that's the phone lines that everything is being phoned in on. And that computer there is one of the first steps of organizing the voting area. It's kind of interesting, it's a transparent room, but the key computers to watch are all the way on the other side. One of the machines turned on and booted the night before. They were activated last night. Once we have confirmation that all of the machines are activated, the precinct is up and ready, the machines are then locked, secured, the site they're in, locked, secured. In Miami-Dade County, we um, cannot turn on our machines on voting day. It's because it's inferior technology, it takes too long, and we cannot possibly open our polls on time if we turn them on the morning of the election. So. Instead, what we do is we turn them on the night before and leave them on all night, live machines ready to be voted on in 700 precincts. You're talking about approximately 7,000 machines left on all night, either unguarded or behind a, a closed door, or if you're really, really lucky, with a security guard or maybe a police officer. We've done everything at a level that's just far beyond at what where it was two years ago, and I think the difference is shown. If the voting software were hacked in November, it's possible no one would ever know. And so it would have no effect, except it could change the outcome of the election. Or perhaps it would be discovered, and that would be a blow to voter confidence. And we already have in this country a crisis of cynicism. I mean, what's the use of voting if they can go behind us and change it? I, I think that the worst conclusion that people could take from this battle is that they shouldn't vote at all. I mean, nobody involved in this battle on either side is interested in people not voting. If I was interested in people not voting, why would I participate in this debate at all? I think it's important for everyone to vote. Yeah, because if we don't vote, then who else is going to do it? This is very important. If you feel strongly about who should win, you should absolutely go vote because it's harder to rig an election the more votes you have to rig. It's much easier to do a 1% rig than a 40% rig. No vote with that. Americans are working hard to protect your right to vote. People, in addition to voting, people have to be vigilant about watching what happens in the respective polling places and precincts. It's important to post the results um, at the site and have poll watchers come by and copy them down. And then when they're transferred to the central place, the central should also 
publish all of the partial precinct results so that people can combine them and make sure that they get the same result. I think that people should have the notion of poll watches and vote watches. Um, this is a very significant election. I think this election means a lot not only to this country but to the world. So I think people need to go to David Dill's website, verifiedvoting.org, and um, find out how they can get involved at the grassroots level and then write to your representative. And so many groups, including Verified Voting, are working extremely hard to get a system like this in place for November to reassure the voters. We've got about as many paper ballots as we're going to have in November, and now we have to look to citizen participation, really, in order to make sure the elections are accurate and honest. If voters have problems on election day, they can do a number of things to get those uh, incident reports into a centralized system so that we can do something with them. The one thing they can do is call the 1-866-HOUR-VOTE number, and they can do that right at the polling place. If they walk in and the machine freezes and it looks like they're going to have to walk away or there's a problem, they can pick up their cell phones and call us right from there and we can help people actually vote. Um, they can also uh, go to the website, which is uh, www.voteprotect.org, V-O-T-E-P-R-O-T-E-C-T.org. There's grassroots effort. I think that politicians will take notice. After all, the elected officials are the ones with the most to lose because they're the ones that need to get votes. Uh, I guess we just have to uh, make sure that, that uh, enough Americans say that this is really important to them. And it's so important to them that they will hold their local uh, representative accountable uh, so, that their, uh, uh, so that their votes can be auditable. Democracy is a project. And what I would say to young people is recognize democracy is a project of empowering ourselves, empowering each other, making our country better and our, and our world better. Um, and join the project. Um, that's what it's about. The fact, if, if the things are, if the institutions are flawed, if the equipment is flawed, the administration is flawed, make it better. That's part of the project. Nobody, 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 nobody